So if you're deep frying, you would want to use avocado oil that's refined, canola oil that's refined. Now this has a little bit higher of a polyunsaturated fat content, so wouldn't be my first choice for frying. Tallow or suet, super great for that. Roasting up to 375 degrees. You have the avocado oil refined, the chicken fat, duck fat, ghee, goose fat, hazelnut oil, palm fruit oil, tallow or suet. Hello, my friend. Today is a special one. We're going to be going through the details around fats. I find like every couple of years I need to do this to just refresh our minds around what fats are good, what fats are not so good, why they're important, why it might not be a great idea to use other sorts of fats, and also to talk about the smoke points of the various fats as we start to really think about how we're gonna use these fats on a daily basis. So rewind, it was around like, mm, I wanna say like January, 2017, my paperback book was due out in the next couple of months and I had this crazy idea to put together a guide for fats. It had never really been done before and I figured like, how hard can it be? There's only like a couple that I would recommend and it should be easy to find the smoke points and all the things. It took me a full two weeks of like nonstop work and research, figuring out how to put together this guide on what fats to use, how to use them, et cetera. So I don't want to recreate the wheel because I worked so hard on that guide. So I'm literally going to open up my book today and I'm going to share with you a bunch of the content from chapter seven of my book, The Keto Diet. Now this was released in 2017. It's still on shelves basically everywhere. So if you're like, dang, this sounds great. You can totally get yourself a copy. And if not, that's cool too. We're we're just gonna read from a couple the pages and really get into the details of fats. And then my friend Brandon is gonna come on to chat with us about macadamia fat and the benefits behind that. So this episode kind of has a double whammy for you, extra benefit. So here we go. It's no secret that you're going to be eating a lot of fat on your ketogenic diet. So it only makes sense to truly understand what's behind the goods, the keywords to watch for, the ones to avoid, and the marketing gimmicks, all of it. Many companies use flashy words to grab our attention, which makes us think that their product is better than it actually is. Case in point, olive oil. Did you know that there was a time when 70% of extra virgin olive oil was sold and was cut with cheaper oils? Although the space has improved in the last couple of years, many olive oils could still contain canola oil or various other oils that aren't even olive-based. After the other oils are added, the concoction is chemically deodorized colored, and sometimes even flavored and sold as extra virgin olive oil. Yuck. One of the things that make a fat or oil safe or unsafe is whether it can become rancid or oxidized. When a fatty substance has been exposed to more heat, oxygen, or light than it can withstand, it goes rancid. And once rancid, these fats may have an effect on our overall health by increasing inflammation. Oxidation can occur in the processing of fat or oil if it's over-processed using methods that go beyond what it can handle or methods that are not safe for the oil or if it's not been stored properly. So when we chat with Brandon in a little bit, we're going to be talking about the oxidation of macadamias and why this is such a prevalent issue and how to avoid it. So the next couple of minutes, we're really going to spend understanding the difference between saturated fats monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, and trans fats. Now, you guys probably know trans fats are not the best, but maybe we're a little bit on the edge of whether or not saturated fats are any good or polyunsaturated fats are any good. So when it comes to most people, we're able to handle our saturated fats pretty well. Most people can handle them pretty well. Now, there are individuals that end up going on a ketogenic diet and their LDL skyrockets. Those are usually the people that have to go for less saturated fats and more monounsaturated fats. So we're going to get into what that means, examples of these fats, and then we'll get into the smoke points and various details around each individual fat. Are you game? Okay, so saturated fats are stable solid at room temperature and great for cooking. Now we're talking about Canadian room temperature, not like Bahamas room temperature. So keep that in mind. 
They've gotten a bad reputation over the last couple of years, but they're actually awesome for our health. They're great for the heart, liver, brain, nervous system, and more. The common fear that saturated fat raises cholesterol is completely unfounded. In fact, focusing on a carbohydrate-rich diet rather than a saturated fat-rich diet increases the risk of coronary heart disease by lowering HDL cholesterol and increasing small particle LDL. In other words, it's not saturated fat or dietary cholesterol that increases the amount of small, dense LDL cholesterol in our bodies. It's an overconsumption of carbohydrates. And despite the popularity of low-fat diets, the increase in the prevalence of diabetes and obesity in the U.S. occurred with an increase in the consumption of carbohydrates, not saturated fat. Now, at the beginning of this, I did say that there's actually a genetic predisposition in the APOE, a genetic realm. I guess you could say that. I think they're called SNPs, if I'm correct. And some people just cannot handle saturated fat, and it will actually make their LDL increase. So I have seen this. I would say that maybe of my 150 clients, maybe two or three have this. So it's not a very common thing that I deal with in practice, but I have seen blood work for this. So examples of saturated fats are going to include beef, coconut oil, lamb, chicken, butter, tallow, or suet, or bacon. So think of when you cook any of those things, you're going to have fats that collect in the dripping pan, and those are going to get hard, Mm, like a good tasty chicken fat. Okay, that's a saturated fat. Then we have the monounsaturated fats and some of the conversation we're having around macadamia nuts and macadamia nut oil a little bit later, those are monounsaturated fats. So we want to consume these often. They're really super great for you, typically liquid at room temperature and solid when chilled. Monounsaturated fats are moderately stable and good for light cooking between around 320 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 160 degrees Celsius, and 350 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 177 degrees Celsius. As long as the oils you're consuming are minimally processed, you want to look for keywords like cold pressed or centrifuge extracted or expeller pressed. There's little chance of consuming oxidated fats, which can cause cell damage. Monounsaturated fats offer several health benefits, especially when they're used instead of trans fats. So we need to understand too that conventional grain-fed meats are higher in omega-6 and lower in omega-3 than grass-fed meats. So if you can't access grass-fed meats, you can go for leaner varieties and add your own healthy fats. So that's going to fall in line with some of the polyunsaturated fat piece that we're going to be talking about in a moment. So examples of monounsaturated fats, they're going to include things like avocado oil, olive oil, almond oil, macadamia nuts, avocados, hazelnuts. I feel like this is my life. I live in this kind of monounsaturated fat realm. I just find, especially if you're going through any liver stuff or you've had your gallbladder removed, I find monounsaturated fats are just handled by the body better than saturated fats. I'm not saying that saturated fats are bad. I've been known to eat coconut oil straight from the jar, okay? But just generally speaking, usually somebody will gravitate more to one or the other, depending on what season of life they're in also. So polyunsaturated fats, I generally recommend that we use these sparingly. Generally, they're they're always going to be liquid, whether you put them in the fridge or you leave them on the counter, they'll always be in a liquid state. They're more likely to become oxidized during heating, so they're not good for cooking unless they are naturally refined and bear a label defining that they are cold-pressed, centrifuge-extracted, or expeller-pressed. You want to seek out minimally processed or naturally refined oils, which are less likely to be oxidized. Foods containing these oils, such as salmon, trout, hemp seeds, chia seeds, flax seeds, should be minimally heated just until cooked. You definitely don't want to roast these things or like totally kill them in the air fryer. Bad idea. Two polyunsaturated fats, omega-3 and omega-6, are considered essential fatty acids. The body cannot produce them, yet they're required for normal body functions, so they must be obtained through food or supplements. Consuming, rather, an unbalanced ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 in the standard American diet, that basically means too much omega-6 is associated with an increase in inflammatory diseases such as metabolic syndrome, autoimmune disorders, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, and psychiatric disorders. The ideal ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 is one-to-one. 
The typical ratio in the standard American diet is 10 to 1. That means 10 omega-6 to 1 omega-3 and even upwards of 25 to 1. Now, a ketogenic diet that's high in saturated fat and low in processed seed oils is naturally balanced in omega-3 to omega-6, generally speaking. Now, when you look at just the propensity toward marketing around soybean oil and corn oil, they're really the considered the like top heart healthy polyunsaturated fats and usually recommended by healthcare organizations. But their ratios of omega-6 to omega-3 are 7 to 1 in the case of the soybean oil and 46 to 1 in the case of the corn oil. So just thinking about this, if we need a 1 to 1 ratio, why the heck are we eating corn oil, which is 46 to 1? And the processing of these fats causes them to become oxidized, contributing to free radical formation and inflammation. So safer polyunsaturated fats are things like hemp seed oil, walnut oil, flaxseed oil. Now, I'm going to say canola oil. I know you might not agree with me. We're going to talk about why I'm not like totally anti-canola oil. Assuming that they are minimally processed and cold pressed, these oils should not be heated, like not be heated. Now, plant-based omega-3s are more difficult for the body to convert into forms that it can use, EPA and DHA. So it's better to go with the animal-based forms such as in fish. EPA and DHA are essential for fetal development, regulated immune response, reduction in inflammation, and improved cardiovascular function. A little tip, if your triglycerides are elevated and you've tried everything and it's just not working, try omegas, like fish-based omegas. In fact, Biotics Research has a really good product I use quite often called Biomega 500 or 1,000 And to lower triglycerides, I usually use the thousand done like one to three times per day. Definitely check with your healthcare practitioner if you want to do that. Now, trans fats, do we really need to go through it? Why don't we? Why don't we just go through it? So trans fats are found primarily in man-made fats, particularly those that are hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated. If you see the words trans fat on a box or bottle or bag, drop it and walk in the opposite direction. Naturally occurring trans fats are found in very small amounts in dairy products and meat from grass-fed animals, and these trans fats actually are beneficial. They can reduce body fat, increase muscle mass, and potentially curtail the formation of breast cancer. Man-made trans fats are created when hydrogen is added to vegetable oils to make them solid at room temperature. The body does not recognize these hydrogenated, fully transformed fats and doesn't know how to eliminate them from the cells. They're harmful for health in so many ways, from contributing to heart disease to increase in type 2 diabetes. The recognized dangers of trans fats have led to their elimination from many consumer goods. Interesterified fat, which is created through an oil refinement process that chemically alters and molecularly rearranges fats, has gained popularity in its place, but this fat promises to raise blood glucose and depress insulin production. Yeah, let's not do that. Basically, you're going to find these scary fats and things like donuts, cookies, buttery spreads, vegan products, really, really common, mayonnaise. So though mayonnaise is a totally acceptable form of fat on your ketogenic diet, definitely, definitely read those labels. Even if it says olive oil, mayo, it's probably going to have some oils that you just don't want. So yeah, that's the differences between polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, saturated, and trans fats. So here, let's talk a little bit about some of the components that make up a good cooking oil so you know what to look for, okay? So we want to look at the extraction and processing method. This is the method used to extract the oil and can affect whether or not the oil supports or damages our health. Was it extracted with chemicals? If toxic chemical solvents such as hexane are involved, trace amounts of this chemical residue are generally left in the final product. Was it extracted with high heat? If so, the sources of the oil meant to withstand those temperatures. If not, the oil can become oxidized and is likely refined further to remove the smell of rancidity. So they make it rancid and then they remove the smell of the rancidity, but it's still rancid. Blech. And then we have to look at the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. Like we talked about previously, we really want that one-to-one ratio. Then we need to understand the smoke point, and this really defines the oil's ability to withstand heat and remain stable. So if you're baking a cake at 350 degrees, 
Fahrenheit, which would be 177 degrees Celsius, and you use an unstable oil, such as like walnut oil, the baking process is going to oxidize the fat, and then that cake is gonna go rancid and it's gonna taste terrible and it's gonna be super bad for you. (laughs) Okay, so that same oil will thrive if you're making a salad with it, but not so good for that cake. Another couple of tips as you're looking for a healthy oil, you definitely want to check the expiration date and choose an oil that's close to harvest date or at least six months from expiration. The oil deteriorates faster in a clear bottle while plastic bottles protect from light. There is a concern that the plastic may dissolve into the oil over time, so it's best to choose oils in dark glass containers when you can. Also, your pots and pans can make a difference. Metals like iron and copper can encourage oxidation and speed up rancidity. Like, I would never put an oil in a cast iron pan. In fact, for most people on this planet, I wouldn't actually recommend a cast iron pan. I see far, 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 far too many women and men, actually a lot of men more so, with excess iron issues. So I just, I would never recommend iron or copper cooking at all. So in regards to the smoke point, I want to go into it a little bit deeper. Like the extraction and processing methods, the smoke point defines the line between health-promoting oil and a health-destructing oil. The less processed an oil is, the higher the nutrient content and therefore the less likely it is to want to play with high heat. So basically, the more natural, the more it probably won't want to be in a hot pan. The more saturated fats and monounsaturated fats an oil contains, the more stable it is. So conversely, the more polyunsaturated fats an oil contains, the more unstable it is at high temperatures, and therefore it'll be prone to oxidation, which encourages inflammation. When heated past its smoke point, fat begins to break down and release free radicals, harmful compounds that damage cells and gives the food a like a scorched flavor. And if the oil smokes in the pan, you really need to discard it. Don't use that oil. Like clean the pan, start over, do it at low temperatures. Like it's not worth eating those pancakes just because they smell good if they're totally cooked in rancid oils. So I want to talk a little bit about canola oil because you might be thinking like, wait, what did she just say? I was not expecting to come across what I did when I looked at a lot of the fats. I don't think canola, like I don't cook with canola oil. I don't have canola oil in the house. My my two go-tos right now are olive oil and avocado oil. Coconut oil is just so messy. And my dog, Coconut, is obsessed with coconut oil. And every time I open the jar, she gets so incredibly hyper. It's like not worth it. I know that sounds crazy, but like I can't calm her down. And so the two fats I've been using the most are avocado oil and olive oil. Um, So I don't keep canola oil in the house, but if I see a product containing canola oil, I'm not as weirded out by it as like something like soybean oil. So I just wanted to take you through some of the canola oil information that I found and you can make up your own mind. So first off, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of canola oil is totally on point. So the distribution of saturated fats to monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats is pretty fabulous in it. And you can source cold press versions like no problem. So the standard checks are in place as we talked about like how to look for a healthy oil. So where did canola oil get this bad reputation? Like after I said canola oil, you're like, who is this chick? Leanne, you're on, you're on crack. Like, what are you talking about? It's generally assumed that all canola oil is refined. A lot of it is, a lot of it is solvent extracted and a lot of it is processed to like the nth degree. And of course that's gonna be absolutely terrible. In addition, there's a ton of genetically modified canola oil on the market. About 90% of the world's canola crop is genetically modified. But let's say we could get a non-GMO, organic, cold pressed and unrefined or chemically free or even low heat refined canola oil, which we totally can, it exists. What then? Keeping in mind that what makes a good cooking oil, which we just covered, let's take a look at how canola oil stacks up to the other oils. So both flaxseed oil and hemp seed oil are touted as health-promoting oils for the very components that canola oil contains, and in many cases, canola oil does it better. The polyunsaturated fats of unrefined canola oil are 32%. Now, hemp seed oil is 80%, and flaxseed oil is 66%. So what we can say from this is that canola oil is naturally more stable than hemp or flax. Because remember, the higher the polyunsaturated, 
content of a product, the more unstable it is. And I get really nervous with hemp and flax oil. I I used to eat it all the time. And now I just, once it goes into my fridge, I know that it's in my fridge, but what did it do to get there? And how long did it sit out? It's just, there are too many, there are too many unknowns with that one. So we know then that canola oil is more stable than hemp or flax. So I'll I'll put that in the win column. Now looking at the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. So canola oil sits at two to one. Hemp seed is three to one and flax seed is four to one. And we know the closer we are to that one-to-one ratio, the better off we'll be. So that's a win. So I'd say canola oil is doing pretty well for itself in those areas. But let's dig in a little bit deeper into the past to understand what, like, what went wrong with the whole canola situation. So canola was bred from rapeseed, which 30 years ago contained elevated levels of uric acid, a monounsaturated omega-9 fatty acid considered harmful to humans. Canola has been bred over the years to have less uric acid. Today's canola oil contains less than 2%. It's worth noting here that breeding plant varieties contain like the qualities of, it, it's very different than a genetic modification and more so just finding the lower uric acid and then combining it with the other one and just like slowly over time adjusting things, okay? So yes, a lot of canola oil will be formed from the genetically modified rapeseed, but there are non-GMO brands out there. So if you look up non-GMO project, you can actually see that there are some canola oils produced from rapeseed that has not been genetically modified and just been traced back through the years um, to get rid of that acid. So what I'm saying here is if you find like a regular canola oil, like let's say your favorite muffin from Whole Foods has canola oil in it. I probably wouldn't eat that. But if you're in a pinch and you're traveling and you find like a non-GMO, cold pressed, unrefined, chemical free, low heated canola oil, I think you're far better off doing that than like a flax or a hemp oil. So that's what I have to say about that. And I still stand behind it. Do I have it in my house? No, but I think it's You know, big thing as I was researching fats and just how all of this came about, I felt it really important to put in the book. (laughs) So if you do have a copy of the book, I was reading from page like 134 to 136. And in the book, there's also a little table on 138 that goes through all the fats. So I'm just going to go through some of the better fats to choose. And then if you want like a full list and what to look for, you're probably going to need the book because this table is epic. Okay, so avocado oil, olive oil, ghee, palm kernel oil, nah, like on paper it looks good. And same with the red palm oil. I don't use this personally too, too much. Some of my nut butters will contain this, but I I go back and forth on whether or not I should use this one. Hazelnut oil, tallow suet, macadamia nut oil, which we're going to be talking about in a sec, chicken fat, duck fat, goose fat, cacao butter or oil, lard or baking grease, butter, coconut oil, avocado oil that's unrefined. So you have refined avocado oil and olive oil. Generally, that will have a higher smoke point. Okay, so that would be like really good for like baking, roasting, frying, those sorts of things. And then you have the olive oil virgin, the olive oil extra virgin, and then the almond oil and the MCT oil. And I really shared that in order of smoke point. Okay, so like MCT oil, you would never cook with. Refined avocado oil, you would cook with. Okay, so just going from the highest smoke point with the avocado oil refined, the smoke point is 520 degrees Fahrenheit or 271 degrees Celsius, all the way down to the MCT oil, which is 320 degrees Fahrenheit, 160 degrees Celsius. Okay, and if you're curious, things like your common extra virgin olive oil that you have in your house, that's a smoke point of 320 degrees Fahrenheit or 160 degrees Celsius. So that's way off. Like you you would definitely want to do that for like salads or light finishing, but you wouldn't want to like roast your vegetables with it, right? So really important information. Yeah, so that's what I have to say about oils and all the things, how to choose the proper fats. If you want examples of, say you're like, hey, Leanne, I'm baking a cake or I'm baking and I need X, Y, Z. Let's go through a couple of examples of what that could look like. So if you're deep frying, 
You would want to use avocado oil that's refined, canola oil that's refined. Now, this has a little bit higher of a polyunsaturated fat content, so wouldn't be my first choice for frying. Tallow or suet, super great for that. Roasting up to 375 degrees. You have the avocado oil refined, the chicken fat, duck fat, ghee, goose fat, hazelnut oil, palm fruit oil, tallow or suet. If you have one pan meals and that's just like a light saute, you can use avocado oil, ghee, goose fat, hazelnut oil. If you're baking and you need like solid fats comparable to butter, you can use cacao butter, coconut oil, ghee, lard. If you're using soups and stews, very similar to the one pan meals, tallow, suet, bacon grease, ghee. If you're using nut and seed pâtés, right? They're not being heated. You can have a lot of fun with that. Walnut oil, palm kernel oil, MCT oil, hemp seed oil, although I'd make sure for sure that you're keeping that refrigerated, almond oil, and then salad dressings. You can have a lot of fun with this too because it's not being heated. Almond oil, macadamia nut oil, MCT oil. For mayonnaise, we talked about that a little bit ago. I really like using avocado oil, the refined stuff, so it doesn't have that flavor to it. Hazelnut oil, macadamia nut oil mayonnaise is pretty darn good. Okay, so those are some ways that you can use it. So our guest today, we're going to switch gears. Now that I've chatted your ears off about 30 minutes about fats, we're going to talk about more fats, specifically macadamia nut fat and, and how it comes about, the oxidation, the risks of processing, the benefits of finding a good macadamia product. I know that when I tried my first actual good macadamia nut, I was like, wow, I've never actually tried a macadamia nut up to this point. It definitely changed the game for me. So Brandon Heimstra, who's the founder of Nutritious Superfood Company, House of Macadamias, you guys know I love their products. He grew up in South Africa and his grandfather was a macadamia nut fam- farmer. He then moved to the United States and began creating his company. Uh, Brandon has always been a very health conscious and living a pretty active life. And we're really excited to have him on the show to just inform us more about macadamias because during my studies, I really didn't delve deep into macadamias. And as I was coming up with the plan for today's episode, I thought it'd be really fun to go through the base of fats and then kind of delve into the monounsaturated fat macadamia. So without further ado, we are going to cut over to this interview, really starting off with asking Brandon how the company came about, how he started being very passionate about macadamias. Hey, my name is Leanne Vogel. I'm fascinated with helping women navigate how to eat, move, and care for their bodies using a low-carb diet. I'm a small-town holistic nutritionist turned three-time international best-selling author turned functional medicine practitioner, offering telemedicine services around the globe to women looking to better their health and stop second-guessing themselves. I'm here to teach you how to wade through the wellness noise to get to the good stuff that'll help you achieve your goals. We're supporting your low-carb life beyond the if-it-fits-your-macros conversation. Hormones, emotions, relationship to your body, workouts, letdowns, motivation, blood work, detoxing, metabolism. I'm providing the tools to put your motivation into action. Think of it like quality time with your bestie mixed with a little med school so you're empowered at your next doctor visit. Get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn about your body and how to care for it better. This is the Keto Diet Podcast. That's a long story, so interrupt me if I ramble, but why, why macadamia nuts? So it's one of the most rare nuts, which is also it's like one of the most difficult things about it because most people have never tried it. It's only 1% of nuts where almonds are around 30%, peanuts are around 35%, cashews, pistachios are around 20%. And the main reason for that was just they grow in a very, very select climate. And nowhere really in Hawaii, in America are they grown. There's a couple of places in Hawaii where they're grown, but Hawaii is wonderful for golf courses and hotels. just very expensive to farm there. So unfortunately, there's no way really in America you can you can buy them. And South Africa actually became like the perfect growing environment for macadamias. Around 20 years ago, we started planting our, our first crop. My grandma was actually a macadamia farmer, not on a large scale, more like a hobby thing. So it's very much kind of like in, in, my, in my blood. And my dad works in agriculture technology. So I kind of grew up seeing this, this trend happen. And we went from being kind of a small player in macadamias to all of a sudden becoming the large grower 
in the world. And the, the main reason is, you know, South Africa, we're good at two things, basically rugby and farming. And and funny enough, like the rain is also very conducive to farming without lots of irrigation. So it's very economical to farm there. And obviously, Africa has quite a large unemployment rate. So a, a huge benefit around being a farmer there is you can always handpick and hand sort for the best quality way. If you do anything with machines, obviously you reduce the labor costs and in Australia they do this, but it's not the same quality. Just having that hand-picked, hand sort element makes a huge, huge difference. So anyways, the macadamia farmers started planting and then all of a sudden, pretty much out of nowhere, we, we became the largest grower of macadamias in the world. And funny, most Africans don't even know this. It's, it's pretty crazy. But if you drive to the farmlands and you take a look, it's just macadamia trees and often baby macadamia trees. So even though the supply is increasing rapidly, there's so many trees still coming online. And as we say, it takes five to 10 years to really like grow a tree. Five years when you start bearing your first crop, 10 years for like full economies of scale. But it's a real investment in time and patience. And we know for a long time, America, obviously the food pyramid was kind of like flipped incorrectly in my opinion, where everyone was eating starch and whole grains of France at the very bottom was fats. And then as people started becoming more aware of healthy fats, demand for macadamia surge and um, that kind of led to price increases as well because it's such a rare and difficult to grow crop there was never the supply to meet the demand so farmers in south africa realized well you know we can really like sell this and make some good money it's selling for two three times the price of almonds sometimes more you know if it's good quality every farmer who was worth their salt were planting macadamias and when i moved to the US originally five years ago i knew about this trend and i realized well, there's actually going to be an, not an oversupply, but almost too many macadamia nuts are coming onto the market. And there hasn't been a brand or any direct to consumer kind of channel that can take macadamia at scale just because supply is always limited. And now, for the first time, we can get enough supply to kind of get macadamia nuts everywhere, get them into 7 Elevens, get them into grocery stores where you can buy it in Arizona, not just in Irwan and in Los Angeles and all that sort of stuff. So that was kind of the, the opportunity. But I don't know anything about the health benefits or all of that. And I realized, you know, if you want to build a brand around something, how do you communicate the benefits to a customer? And I think they taste fantastic, but that wasn't enough of a reason to start a brand around it. So when I started doing a bit of deep diving on why they're special and is there enough unique health benefits to actually like build a brand around this, it, it, it was astounding. And I'll just mention a couple of things. I, I want to see the listeners, you know, me rambling on the health benefits, but the three main big ones is obviously carbohydrates. So it's probably one of the most low carb nuts, which is, which is fantastic around Third, as many carbohydrates as almonds, almost half as many as cashews. So that's a huge one why they've grown popular in, in the keto community. But also people who use blood glucose monitoring devices. It's a big trend right now. I have a lot of friends in this space and they all walk around these, you know, these blood glucose monitoring devices. And if you want to snack and measure your, your spike, macadamias are pretty much the perfect snack for that. The second big health benefit was obviously the fat profile. So I think when people started eating keto, it was pretty much just have fats and didn't really matter what sort of fat you had, just you know, try to keep your carbs as low as possible. But there's a bit of awareness now around the sorts of fats and having lots of trans fats and things fried and even too many saturated fats, especially like you know, the ones that are that you cook at high temperature, can be bad for you. And Mediterranean has always been always been popular and and very important now is the omega six and omega three ratio. A lot of people are talking about this and optimizing for as low omega sixes, polyunsaturated fats for a high omega three ratio, and macadamias pretty much have one of, one of the most perfect ones. It's a six to one ratio, where something like almonds, I, I might be incorrect, but it's something like two hundred to one, so completely out of whack. So it's, it's got an ideal omega six to omega three ratio. And the last one, which is a big one, and a lot of our messaging is around this, is the omega seven. So omega seven is a very special rare fatty acid. It's pretty much found in macadamia nuts and buckthorn, which I mean, it's like sea buckthorn which i don't even know what it is i've never seen a sea buckthorn but that's the one source online where you can find omega sevens and this fatty acid is just it's it's incredible so the three main benefits that that, that we talk about is because uh, people often think i'm gonna eat macadamia it's a slightly high calories i'm gonna i'm gonna gain weight but omega sevens have actually been linked to fat loss and there's a lots of ways how it works in your system satiate is a big one but actually it helps release some fat cells in, in your in your body now the human studies have a bit done, but they've done this on mice, and this is a PubMed study, and it's, it's pretty compelling work. The second huge benefit around omega-7s is the natural collagen production. So a lot of times people who eat more plant-based, who don't eat you know, a lot of collagen heavy meats and stuff, they don't get enough collagen, and omega-7 is a natural way for your body to produce collagen. So wonderful for anti-aging. And now you're seeing a big trend with macadamia oil and moisturizers and, and anti-aging products, which is actually uh, pretty exciting. So that's the, sec the second big trend. And then a huge thing about uh, omega-7s, that people don't realize is actually the anti-inflammatory effect. And obviously keeping your body inflammation as low as possible is huge for 
weight management and you know living a long healthy life and there's actually an incredible study and this was done by the professor noakes foundation comparing macadamia oil to olive oil and coconut oil and macadamia has actually outranked both of them for keeping inflammation the lowest possible which is super exciting i love olive oil i think it's amazing but you know macadamia oil has got even better fat profile and you can actually cook with it at a higher cooking temperature which is super exciting and then the last huge benefit on macadamia is that people you know, don't know about, uh, at least omega-7s, is that it, it actually it, it's super beneficial for, I think I mentioned actually the collagen production. But yeah, th- th- those, are the, those, are, those are the main benefits around macadamias. And once you hear about these things, people are on a way we see a really good response rate and kind of people who, who order and try the product. And that, that's the most important thing at the end of the day. You can have a lot of health benefits and stuff, but the critical thing is, you enjoy eating the product as a tasty, can you incorporate it into your daily lifestyle? And that's where we put a lot of effort in is creating the product innovation around this. So that's kind of the essence around our brand. A huge part of around the brand as well is we've got to make sure that we have the best quality and supply possible because the high fat content is wonderful for the benefits, but it's also very unstable. You've got to make sure it's in the right climate control environment and it can go rancid very quickly. So we have to have complete end-to-end control of where they're farmed, how they source, how they package. And we're very lucky where we partner with over 96 farmers called Golden Academies. It's a consortium of, of farmers. They're the largest in the world. And we share office space with them. They actually invested in the brand. And it's, it's quite a beautiful story where, you know, we have direct, at least, oversights on sourcing the best macadamias possible. So no, no brand can do that like us at scale, which is very helpful. And then our, our products are manufactured very close to the source. So they literally shelled put in packages and then often air freights it into the US or UK, wherever we sell them. So that's a, that's a little bit about macadamias. There's a couple of exciting trends that I feel like we're catching that I, that I mentioned, the blood glucose monitoring, the longevity. And the third big trend is obviously people moving more towards Mediterranean key to watch things going to be a big trend. And a huge thing for us is just, yeah, just delighting our customers with the best product and, and quality possible. And we're still a baby company. I mean, two years old, but the growth has been been very exciting. We uh, now nationwide of the semi eleven, a couple of other big accounts and working with wonderful partners like yourself and Joe Rogan and Tim Ferriss. I think we're the first real snack brand that they've ever endorsed. And they don't endorse products like you. There's a massive filter you have to go through and they have to really believe in the product and, and the benefits. So yeah, we're very excited about the potential. And there's some, some big announcements as well regarding our retail partners coming soon. So I think you rambled way too long. I'm sorry about that, but that's so that's it's so exciting it's so exciting i know when when you guys came and chatted with me i was like and i told you this before we started recording like i don't know macadamia nuts like i i on the podcast recording for years i had i'm known as the nutritionist that mixes either pork rinds with avocado oil mayo or the other message was macadamia nuts with coconut oil and salt and that was my that was my snack. And I just thought like a macadamia nut is a macadamia nut. Like I can get them at Costco and they're quite expensive. Is this really going to be beneficial? And then you guys said like, just we'll send you some and see what you think. And there really is, I can definitely say i had never had a macadamia nut until I had yours. And I think, and you touched on it a little bit was the unstable rancid fat situation of just I think that's maybe part of it. And put a lot of people off. Yeah. I just, and they kind of taste plasticky or they have like a, a very different texture than yours, which are very crunchy and flavorful. Whereas the rancid ones, I mean, people know what rancid fat tastes like. You know, if you leave almonds in the cupboard for too long and you eat them and they're just stale and gross. And that's, that's what I was eating and didn't even realize until I tried your product. Yeah, I think the the entire key is, you know, when you crack open the macadamia, so it's a very, very thick shell. And once you crack it open, you got to make sure you package it in an oxygen controlled environment. Otherwise, it does oxidize and also denatures the fat, which is which is super important to keep everything as 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 whole as possible. So that's where we put a lot of effort in because yeah, it can ruin your your whole experience. And and it's funny, one other benefit I forgot to mention, and the one thing about diet that you have to be well health recommendations and stuff is because. There's never like, you know, one stroke that fits everyone's uh, preferences and everything. And there's so many debates online. You don't know if carnivore is like the trend or vegan is a trend or some people are saying like, you know, sugar doesn't cause diabetes. It's very, very confusing. But I do think a, a huge measurement of what you're eating is good for you is how you feel afterwards. And I know if we eat macadamia, you don't feel terribly bloated. You feel nice and satiated, but it's, it's not a massive bloating. And there's a, there's a thing called lectins that obviously became quite popular with the book, The Prime Paradox. And 
there's still debates around lectins and if they're actually that bad for you and all that. To me, I know if I eat lectin high foods, it does cause a bit of bloating for me. If you eat a big raw kale salad, like don't tend to feel too good afterwards. And macadamia is one of the few nuts that actually have low lectins. Peanuts, almonds have very high lectins. Macadamias have super low, which is very helpful. And I was chatting with with, uh, with a friend about this, and it's funny because macadamias have the thicker shell. Like if the shell is super; it's almost impossible to break open unless you have like a hammer. And potentially, because the argument about lectins is that it's a way of plants keeping away herbivores from eating them. It's a defense mechanism. And maybe because macadamias have that thick shell, it's kind of their defense mechanism. So instead of producing lectins, they have that. So once you break it, and it's just super easy to eat and digest well, and you feel fantastic. So yeah, that's a it's a it's a big thing. We try and yeah. Whether you're keto, low carb, paleo, or somewhere in between, electrolytes facilitate hundreds of functions in the body, including the conduction of nerve impulses, hormonal regulation, nutrient absorption, and fluid balance. This is amplified on the ketogenic diet, but every human requires this balance. When you have adrenal hypo or hyperfunction, this affects your body's sodium potassium balance. If you get headaches behind your left eye, that's a good sign you need sodium. If you get headaches behind your right eye, that's that's a good sign that you need potassium. I cannot tell you how many of my one-on-one -on -one clients come to me with an imbalance in electrolytes in some way, whether that be displaying in headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue, sleepiness, or seen right there in their blood work or their hair tissue mineral analysis. Much of this is improved with proper electrolyte supplementation. Now, I consume a lot of packets a day. There are days where I'll have three or four packets of Element a day, but I definitely always, always have at least one. And not just any type of electrolyte packets, it has to be Element because there's no sugar, there's no fillers, there's no color, there's no artificial anything. It is crazy what other electrolyte brands will put in their packets. No thank you. Now, what I really, really ultra love about Element is the balance of electrolytes. They have 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. Now, right now, Element is offering my listeners a free sample pack with any order. That's eight single-serving packets totally free with an Element order. This is a great way to try all eight flavors or share element with a salty friend. Get yours by going to drinklmnt.com slash KDP. This deal is only available through my link. You must go to drinklmnt.com slash KDP. An element offers a no questions asked refund. So if you don't like it, contact them and get your money back. No questions asked. I gotta say, walking into my friend's house or jumping into a friend's car and seeing their element packets on the floor or in a little container on their counter is literally the best feeling. The fact that I get to share this product with you guys and you get to love it as much as I do is such a gift. Again, if you go to drinklmnt.com slash KDP, you can get your free sample pack with any order. You mentioned almonds and I think there's a huge concern around almond production requiring a ton of water. Do you know how much water macadamia nuts use or what that process is kind of like compared to other nuts? Yeah, so it's also a tree, and the tree can grow pretty big. So the water requirements are, are quite similar. It's definitely less, but the huge thing around where a lot of our farms are is that it's all rainfall irrigation. There's enough water there just from the environment for it to grow naturally without a ton of irrigation. And I know in California, the water is very limited, and there's a couple of farms here with their own water rights. And by the time it reaches us, actually paying like three, four times the prices, at least where we grow a lot of our macadamias, it's, it's completely natural, and it's how they would have grown without any human intervention. So uh, that that's a big benefit, yeah, around it. And you mentioned an oxygen, like depleted environment when you're packaging, so oxidation doesn't happen. What are some of the other risks of processing when we're looking at, you know, maybe that Costco bag of macadamia nuts versus something like what you guys create? Yeah, I think consistency is a, is a massive thing as well. Consistency where every bite feels like tastes the same and one bite isn't harder than the other one. And that all comes down just from sourcing from the right farmers. And the weird thing about macadamia is, is you have no control once you break open the shell, the size of the nuts, if it's going to be a perfect hole or a half or a piece. And typically the pieces, like the smaller styles you use for, let's say, butters and those sorts of things because they are cheaper. And then the perfect hole, they're very expensive. Those are the ones that you find in 
high-end Racadamia brands. So I always recommend, if you buy Kirkland and stuff, it's probably going to be, and we love Costco and everything, I'm not going to say anything bad about that, great value, but you're probably going to have a lot of pieces and a lot of inconsistencies. Some might be darker than others. Some might taste a little bit more rancid than, than others, a little bit more fresh than others. So for us, we have to control the consistency and we try to keep all the sizes the same. A beautiful round macadamia. So whenever you, you, you buy it, the next one, you know what to expect. So that, that, that's a massive part about what we do. Right. And mostly in South Africa. But if I look at the packages of other products, they're kind of from all over the place. Why is that? Like, can they be grown all over the place or is there a certain area that's better and why? Yeah, I, I think the big thing around where they are, they are growing. So, so South Africa is growing a lot, but there are some farms in Southern Africa also growing macadamias now, which is which is pretty cool. It's just because like you must understand the political environment there, the, the unemployment like America, I think is around four or five percent. And when it gets to ten percent, people will get upset. But in in Southern Africa, you're sitting around over forty percent, and that's what the government puts out. It's probably even worse. So any jobs, especially good farm working jobs, people are desperate for. So. It's great to see that even in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, they are starting to plant macadamias now. But again, it all comes down to there's a certain expertise you need in the harvesting process that I feel like South Africa is, is very, very good at compared to other places. So I think that's why we prefer working with South African farmers. And, and again, now and then work with the Mozambican farmer if it's a great crop. Like we, we don't want to discriminate. We think you know Southern Africa as a whole can benefit from this. But that, that's a huge part about um, our sourcing. And, and again, a huge reason on why we started this brand is obviously moving here. I'm still very proud of my country and I want to try to provide as much opportunities back home as possible. Is As we kind of grow this category from pretty much nothing, they stand to benefit because the future of their industry is going to be insured. So yeah, that's, that's kind of why are we doing this? I guess it's a crazy idea. Yeah, completely. And I would love just more of like a personal question. What, what do you love most about your job? And it sounds like maybe you answered it a little bit in the last little bit, but I would love to just hear like what lights you up about all this. Yeah, ob- obviously it's very personal to me knowing my, my grandma was a macadamia farmer and, and that and having a bit of home with me. So, but besides the personal angle, uh, I mean, business is pretty much just solving problems. It's creative problem solving. Um, every day you face with certain problems that you're trying to find a solution to. And if I didn't have those problems, I don't know what I would be doing in my time. <laughs> so I really do enjoy that. And I think I like to, to I like to think the best entrepreneurs are the ones who do have a bit of imagination and creativity because everyone, every business will be faced with the same problem, which is like, how do I get to as many customers as possible? And if you copy and paste the same strategy that everyone is using, so let's say, I'm going to do influencer ads. I'm going to do meta ads in a certain way because that's what everyone does. Or I'm just going to do a certain email marketing strategy because I read it online from a, a Google kind of document or something. It might work a little bit, but my, my biggest learning has been the more people who copy a strategy, the, the lower your returns are. And whenever we, we face a problem with a slightly creative solution, you have a better outcome. And, and you can kind of see it through the history of, of advertising. When and the, the newspaper was first invented. The first businesses to advertise the newspaper had an amazing return. And then it was radio and then TV. If you advertise any fridge on TV, as the first fridge probably would have sold plenty. And then obviously the internet came along and Google search was like the big medium. And then YouTube came along and you see amazing brands that were the first ones on YouTube advertising with influencer marketing in it. And then Instagram came along. But now it's pretty much meta is so overdone, so oversaturated. So for us, it's how do we approach the strategy with a unique angle? We, we feel like we have a unique value proposition. That's very difficult to communicate from a billboard. And one of my favorite marketers of all time is a guy called David Ogilvy. I think Mad Men was based on him. And he said in one of his books that you cannot sell a unique product from a picture because people aren't going to understand it. And I feel with macadamia, a lot of the times people don't know about it. They never tried it. So for us, we really love the podcast format and also with YouTubers where they can kind of communicate to the audience longer than 10 seconds on, 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 on why it matters. And there's also a bit of a filter, you know, like Leanne, I'm sure with you, you know, you're very selective with the brands you work with. I'm sure a lot of brands try to push products onto you, as you say, and the Mac and was, was a bit, it was a, a bit of a learning curve where with like meta ads and Instagram ads, any person can kind of just, you know, put an ad up on there. So for us, it's always like the creative problem solving. And we obviously have a very complex supply chain, like everything is bottom in South Africa. And, and it's not just, it's not like Johannesburg or, or Durban, the big cities and the big ports. These are small little rural towns where there's literally like maybe one or two gas stations. I grew up in one of these towns and when we, when we got our first like burger restaurant, it was like this massive, this massive thing, you know? So there's not, not, not a lot of infrastructure there and that's the environment we're working with, but all in the purpose of delivering the best product possible. So you kind of have to face everything with a, a creative solution, which is what I really enjoy. And I, and I, and I think that, 
you know, from Steve Jobs and Elon, these guys necessarily they didn't have experience building rockets or electric cars, but because they approached the problem in a different way, they found a, a great solution, which is kind of why we we approaching our business in a way like, you know, why aren't more snacks advertising on big podcasts? And, you know, people think nuts are a commodity, but, you know, they're, they're, it's an amazing it's an amazing kind of commodity where you can do so much with a certain nut and we think macadamias are the best. So for us, we want to expand into dairy at some point. We're working hard on that front. We can expand into cookies, cereals, all this sort of stuff. Obviously, you have to stay focused as a, as a businessman. So my team's probably going to have a heart attack if they hear me talking about all these things. But um, <laughs> Stop! Yeah. God, it's just, no. Uh, yeah, there, there's just so much you can do with with nuts that hasn't been done before, and that's why we enjoy what we're doing. And what I enjoy the most about building a business, and again, you get to work with fantastic people. It's people say this all the time, but your your team kind of make the company, and you have to be so selective with the people you work with. And we try to build a culture where it's very conducive for those who put their hand up and try to be proactive, and then those you know who want a more you know, eight to five, very simple job. They're naturally, you know, it's not going to be a good fit and they find their way out of the system. And I, and, and I compare myself, you know, well, at least what we're trying to build to Tesla. Tesla had a very high turnover in the beginning, meaning employer retention, because it wasn't the right fit for everyone, but they built something exceptional over time. So that's kind of the culture that we want to try to build. Because again, the, the, the upside is huge. And sorry, last thing I'll mention, but just talking like numbers, if you had to guess what Nutella annual sales are, what would you guess? Just one product, one brand that has 14% hairs on that. What would you guess? Oh my Nutella. goodness. I would have no idea. Like maybe this is so wrong. I just know Nutella is huge in Europe. It's ginormous. So like, I don't know, like 50 million. Yeah. Th- listen, that's not a bad guess because it's one part I want skew. Okay. But uh, uh, okay. So there's a Nutella consumed every second and they do over $2 billion in sales every single $2.4 billion in sales every year. And it's just 40% hazelnuts. It's crazy, yeah. Reese's peanut butter cups, only found in America, only one product. I doubt it's over, it's probably around 30% peanut butter. If you had to guess the annual sales of Reese's peanut butter cups, what would you guess? Oh, I'm failing at this game. I I don't (laughs) know. Like, like too far off. (laughs) A hundred million. So it's $2 billion just just in the US. Yeah, so the the scale is massive for for these things, which is, you know, why isn't there a macadamia? But about a cup, you know, all, all those sorts of things we want to try to expand into eventually, you know, and, and, and we firmly believe that consumers are becoming more aware. You can you can bank on one thing. America is generally becoming more aware on certain health trends and all that. And we kind of see it as like as a hierarchy of needs. Obviously, you have to be fed, number one, and then you work your way all the way down. And once you have all your kind of your needs met, you have time to educate yourself on the health benefits. And there's actually a guy that I'm quite a fan of. Uh, a lot of people don't like him right now because this. This is this rich tech guy, um, Brian Johnson. I don't know if you've seen him on, on Twitter, but he's kind of started a very cool company, Braintree and Venmo, that he sold to PayPal uh, for quite a bit of money. And now he's become obsessed with extending his lifespan. And if you look at his diet, like he's going everything by the book, by data, not, not on how he feels on his biometric markers. And one of his famous treats that he posts online is a, a, a nutty pudding, like a nut pudding. And the first ingredient is macadamia. So and this guy is like, you know, he, he's when it comes to tech and monitoring everything, like he's pretty much, I think, the leader in this space. So we feel like there's a huge awareness coming around macadamia and all of our products will never add sugar, keep them as healthy as possible. And I just don't see, I don't know, I, I see Reese's Peanut Butter Cups being around for the next like 10 years. But I mean, gee, $2 billion in sales. I'm hopeful more Americans start, you know, choosing healthy options. So we, we want to present a healthy option that's tastier, that you enjoy eating more. And hopefully we can start changing some of those trends. Yeah, completely. I I know like as a lot of people don't understand the business of a podcast and being an influencer, or, or in my case, more of a practitioner that has these resources for people, there's a huge business behind all of this of companies, like you said, reaching out to me, try our product, do this, it'd be great. And I must send well, I definitely send way more no's than I say yeses. And oftentimes if I look at a brand, I'm like, yeah, that looks pretty good. I'll try it. Then it's terrible or some other parts of their program or, or of their offering doesn't work. But I was very surprised by your ingredients, your choice of ingredients. I could see that it was intentional. And I think that's what drew me in, in addition to the taste, because that was definitely a huge factor. But just it's it's not only the one product, but it's how does this company facilitate these products and the suite of products, because that's also really important. As soon as you have something in the suite that doesn't make sense and doesn't align with 
what I want to share or what I think the community needs, it's my responsibility to shut that down. Right. And so I think a lot of people don't, and I'll never forget a blogger recommended a frozen fruit mix on her blog many, many, many years ago before I was even on the internet. And I went to the store, I picked it up, I made a smoothie, didn't even read the ingredients. First ingredient was sugar. And that was the last time I ever followed her. Like that was it. And so I really do take this stuff really seriously because I know it's just your one recommendation away from potentially losing somebody that is getting value from you and you screwed it up. And so, like you said, it's so important. It is so, so, so important, not only for brands to create these things, but also for the people promoting them to understand the severity of and the seriousness of their recommendations. Yeah, it takes a lot of civil reputation and, and seconds to often, you know, destroy it. So yeah, yeah absolutely. And for everyone who buys from us, like we do put a hundred percent money back guarantee that if it's not the best macadamias you've ever eaten, we'll send you your money back. No questions asked. Potentially, even if you want a different product, we'll send that as well. We have to put our name on the line. You know, it's, it's just, it's so, it's so important. People are just being bombarded with brands like left, right and center. And it's, it's exhausting being a consumer in America, seeing a lot of brands trying to sell things. And there's a lot of big money at play. Like a, a lot of large companies have spent a lot of, a lot of dollars on getting sugary, unhealthy products out in front of, um, out in front of people. And, but we just, you know, because we, we're small and we don't have those resources, we just can't compromise. We have to use the best ingredients and we have to trust that the consumer will, or that the customer will know what the best option is for them. So that's kind of how we're going about it. But I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I think in, in the next 10 or 20 years, um, you'll start seeing a lot of these large, like sugary snacks start slowly dying down. I, I feel there always be a market. People just want to buy Reese's peanut butter cup. It's a comfort food and everything, but you just don't want to compromise where it's like, this tastes just as good. It's better for me. And it's not going to have the crazy sugar spike that, that you'd normally get. So Completely. The feeling after the food, like what you were mentioning earlier, that's really how I live by. If the food doesn't make me feel good after, I'm probably not going to eat it again. <laughs> yeah. Do you mind me if I ask you just a, just a question? Because like, you probably have a great lens on this. How do you feel like the debate between carnivore and vegan or all, all these sorts of like you know extreme diets? Because it, 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 it seems like there's a especially in the last five years, like every vocal certain movement has gotten even more vocal and more, more confidence in kind of their way of eating. And maybe it's a lot of it's placebo. Like you're just so certain what you're eating is good for you, but you listen to someone like Jordan Peterson. He is so convinced that ribeyes are his, his, his way to go. And we also work with a wonderful gentleman called Rich Roll, who's obviously been very healthy eating plant-based. And it's just, it's very, it's very confusing. So how, how, how do you navigate the whole landscape and everything? I'm just, I'd, yeah, I'd love to know. Yeah. It's, it's such a great question. It's such a great question. I think ultimately, I don't think one diet is intended to be followed forever. I think that's where we get a lot of hangups is I'm a vegan and therefore I eat vegan. And now I'm vegan for 10, 12, 15, 20 years. I've it's very rare that I've met a chronic vegan that's been healthy. Same with a chronic keto dieter, same with a chronic carnivore. I think, I think the beauty is in variety. And so there will be what I encourage many of my clients to do is like rotating things. Like you, you're not a hundred percent carnivore. You're not a hundred percent keto. You're not a hundred percent vegan, but we can dabble in all these different areas. And there may be times in your life where you resonate more with a carnivore diet. Like if your gut is an absolute mess and you have insulin resistance and you have a lot of infections going on, carnivore is probably going to be your best bet because your gut is just so inflamed. Is it your best bet forever? I don't think so. Same with the ketogenic diet. If you are dealing with a lot of insulin resistance, weight loss resistance, maybe a lot of cravings, not so much yeast infections. If you're dealing with yeast, then I wouldn't recommend a hardcore ketogenic diet because the yeast is going to eat off the the ketones just like it would sugar. And so I think just understanding that there are different times in our lives where we need different things. And I think it takes being humble and understanding that there doesn't need to be pride with your diet. And I think also there are certain ingredients I know like through what I was talking about earlier with the pork rinds and avocado mayo, I could not eat that now. Like that would make me just feel terrible. But during that time, I loved it. I needed so many fats and that was the way that I was doing it. And so I think we can often just get really hyper-focused. I know that when I was on tour, I think it was one of my last book tours, there was like a constant theme of women saying, but it worked for me before. Why isn't it working now? 
And I think oftentimes we think, well, what worked for me two years ago to lose weight, to feel better. If I just do that again, I'm going to feel better. But you're a completely different person with a different lifestyle, um, different thoughts, maybe a different job, a different environment that you're living in, and you're going to need something different. And so I think that's where we run into major issues is just doing something too long or trying to go back to something that just can't exist in this paradigm now. So that's those are my thoughts. No, oh, that's super insightful. And I, and I think, especially from your experience, like you, you're talking from firsthand kind of going through everything. I always like to just take it back to how things were maybe like 10,000 years ago on the Savannah, because the greater scheme of things, like we, we, we don't evolve that quickly. So for me, it's just always, you know, were we eating Twinkies on the Savannah? Probably not. Were we eating the whole day and like a, a, a surplus of the calories? Probably not because, you know, food, you have to go really make an effort to, to go, go get food. And, you know, the, the whole blue zone diet, I think there's a little bit of truth in that. I, I've noticed that the foods and things tend to vary, but things that don't vary is obviously the social, social community aspect of it. And people don't tend to overeat in these areas, whether it's Okinawa or someplace in California, Mo Belinda, I got, might have got the name wrong, and Costa Rica. They don't tend to overeat because there aren't a bunch of Walmarts in the area and it's so easy to buy these, these snacking. And you can probably be relatively healthy, like Warren Buffett, who has a Coke and hamburger day, you know, I suppose. But it's so much harder. It's so much more difficult because you're probably going to get hungry very, very soon. And it's so easy to overdo your calories. And I think the one trend is most people, they, they aren't obese or overweight. So I think if you start with that, like what, what makes you feel good, we can still exercise and everything. Make it as easy for yourself as possible. I know I'd have a very hard time trying to you know, get in shape or lose weight just eating Twinkies. Some people might have that, that you know, <laughs> resilience, but I, I, I definitely don't. Where, you know, some protein and some good fats, you're probably not going to get very hungry very soon. So I think it's all just that mental power and you, you got to start with that. It's like what objectively is makes you feel good and what objective is better for your body and, and, and go from there. But yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to navigate the space. And I, I really feel, you know, people trying to like find the right solution. It's, it's a challenge. Definitely is a challenge. I was traveling for the day and I had packed myself a lunch. It had all these tasty things in it. I was so excited to chow down but I had to go to a meeting and I forgot my lunch kit with my husband. Now I'm sitting at that meeting. It's going to be like a four to five hour meeting. I'm pretty hungry. I have my big ginormous 50 ounce water bottle beside me. I don't even have electrolytes. I'm digging through my purse thinking maybe, maybe I left a snack in my bag. And to my surprise, there was a little packet of sea salt macadamia nuts and I must have squealed because people looked over and I was so excited and man, did it pack a punch. I was so thankful to have those little fat bombs in my purse. Now, macadamia nuts are one of my favorite nuts. They are high in fat, low in carbohydrates, so incredibly satiating. Now, a lot of us keep fat bombs. You know, we went through that whole phase where we had all these fat bombs sitting around. I know I did. Maybe you're still in that phase of your ketogenic diet where you're spending all this time, energy, and money making different types of fat bombs. I encourage you instead to check out House of Macadamias. They make the most delicious macadamia nuts. Each little packet is loaded with flavor. They have onion, sea salt, zesty salsa, chocolate, white chocolate, and white chocolate raspberry dipped, dairy-free flavors of macadamia nuts, and there's no funky ingredients. It's like a great replacement to chips. If you like chips or little snacky things, Oh, these packets are incredible. When you go to houseofmacadamias.com slash KDP and check out their selection of fat-fueled snacks, their bars are really good too. And if you like what you see, you can use the coupon code KDP20 for 20% off your first purchase. That's houseofmacadamias.com slash KDP and use the code KDP20 for 20% off. Oh, it totally is. And you hear, have you seen those Instagram reels of people like eating cereal and then they're watching something on their phone that says cereal is the worst thing ever. So they throw it out and then and they say, but eat kale. And so he's eating kale and then he watches the next video and it's like, kale will kill you. And he goes to the next thing. And so it's so true. It's like, we have all these voices in our heads telling us what to do, how to do it, when to do it. And it's just, it's completely overwhelming. And I get it. You know, I've been a nutritionist since 2007. So for me, I can wade through the garbage and, you know, just go for the good stuff. But I think ultimately 
you're right. If you're eating a good amount of protein in whatever form, you're eating real foods, you have fats in your diet, I think you're pretty much good. Like, yes, you can get varieties. And if you want to optimize your health, you may need to shift things. But I will say that I've, I've never seen a healthy, chronic person in any of those spaces of carnivore, vegan, keto. I think we just take it too far. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think if, if you're surviving the savannah being chased by lions, you can't really say, I'm not, I'm eating just, you know, vegan today. You're probably going to have to like be a bit more resourceful and be more, be a bit more open. But I, I really respect like everyone's diet. And I think that you can do, you can be healthy on anything if you follow correctly. It just becomes a bit more of a challenge. So I think you yeah, just have to be very, very aware. And, and for me, it's just the, the blood glucose. And like, oh my word, if, if you eat a big bowl of pasta, like try, like try going to a meeting without falling asleep. It's, it's, it's difficult, you know? So there's certain like biochemical reactions that I feel like we are, you know, attuned to like your liver can store a certain amount of carbs at a time. If you eat a high sugar meal, it's probably going to straight into blood. So the extra carbs will probably be, you know, stored as fat where if you eat something a bit more, a little slightly higher fat, better protein, it's a much lower release. You'll be satiated and you're not going to have that crash. So I think those sorts of things are at least understood, but there's a lot that that's not. And I take my hat off to you trying to help people to navigate this crazy world. So it's definitely not easy. Yeah, it is. It is so much. It is so much. And that's what we try to do here on the podcast is just give you guys the information. And and because everyone is so unique, certain things that you hear are just not going to fit for you. And it takes that discernment and just trial and error and humility to just be like, well, well, I tried that. It didn't feel good. Moving on to the next thing instead of pushing and pushing and saying, but if I just but if I just did it a little bit harder, a little bit better, like I think pretty quickly you learn whether or not something is working for you, except in the case of keto flu, that will suck no matter who you are. And you just got to get through that bit when you start a ketogenic diet. But I think when it comes to just food selection, ultimately, the more natural it is, the better. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a huge thing. The closer you can be from the source, the better. And it's also like why, you know, I was very careful where I wanted to spend the next 10, 10 years of my life because that's what you have to decide when you make any big career move. Like, can you see yourself here for the next 10 years? And we're not selling some new, like, I don't know, green powder or, you know, some magical, you know, oil that's going to like cure this. We're literally selling a very wholesome product that's been around for, for decades. Actually, it did originate in Hawaii. The, so whenever you buy macadamias, you can kind of say they all kind of source from Hawaii. It's similar to how the oranges we eat now went to oranges necessarily. Everyone was eating 2,000 years ago. Hawaii were actually the ones who first kind of like focused on breeding the strain that everyone eats now of macadamia. It's called the the, ba- the Beaumont Baymont. So we do a lot to we do a lot to Hawaii. It's just you know it's just a lot of golf courses and four seasons hotel. It's not the most fun way to farm there. So yeah, we owe a lot to Hawaii. That's for sure. I've never been to Hawaii. It's on my list. Uh, it's a it, it's a it's a great spot. Great for golf. Oh, I bet. I'm not a golfer. I do you like golf? Is that a thing you do? Not right now. I think I need to earn the right to spend to spend a couple of hours on the golf course. I'm still. I think right now my life is dedicated to academia, so I, I have to focus <laughs> on that right now. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, that's you your ten year plan. <laughs> yeah, you have to choose. You know, it's very easy to get sidetracked with too many hobbies, and I, I get very obsessed about anything. So I know if I. I spend a bit of time now on golf. It'll be dangerous. Or we just want yeah. to spend hours playing golf. Yeah. I am exactly the same. I'm the exactly, exactly the same. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was really great to get to know you and uh, the heart behind the business and some details about macadamia nuts. I will be sure to include links to your guys' page, houseofmacadamias.com slash KDP for you guys. And yeah, say, thanks again. Yeah. For your listeners, like whenever someone uses like your code, we'll give a free macadamia oil, no matter what water size on us. And it's worth $20, but we really want people just to try it. It's fantastic on on salads, vegetables, wonderful for cooking. If you are going to grill a steak, it's actually delicious on steak. It adds a beautiful nutty, nut buttery, buttery flavor and obviously without the high saturated fat. So you'll get it from the steak and then the macadamia oil fat will kind of balance it out. But yeah, we're happy to add that in. And, we, and this is all thanks to our farmers. We, we can only do this because we have their supports and they just want to get as many people in the world to try macadamias and uh, and yeah it's been it's been wonderful to talk to you and thanks for listening and i apologize if you had to listen to my bad accent and the rambling but it's been fun hope you can do it soon yes it was definitely fun and thank you for throwing that in i personally have not tried your macadamia nut oil so i'm gonna need to place an order so that i get some too because now i'm jealous <laughs> We're gonna we have we have to send you some. It's 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 fantastic. Yeah, it's definitely one of a kind.
And honestly, it's good on everything. It's great for cooking, great for salads. So yeah, we want to try and get it out there. Okay, that's great. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. And again, the link is houseofmacadamias.com slash KDP. Thanks. Cool. All right. Have a good one. Thanks for listening. Join us next Tuesday for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. Looking for more resources? Go to healthfulpursuit.com for keto meal plans, weight loss programs, low carb recipes, and oodles of free resources to get you going. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representation or warranties of any kind please consult a qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program. 